MHA Podcast. MHA Podcast. MHA Podcast. Hey, I am hosting the show, Quinn. I'm sorry. You are taking <laughs> the word right out of my mouth. Well, Todd's drooling at the mouth. Let me get you a oh, tissue right well, here. Then. I'm worried that he's Nick Foles. I see the word regression plastered all over his stats. Well, and I cheated a little bit here. You bastard, how could you? This is a cheat-free zone, a Tom Brady-free zone, and you're funking it up. If I want to win a fantasy championship, I, well, I don't want my quarterback doing that crap. I have Theo Riddick in front of... Okay. What the f***? <laughs> wow. Eddie Lacy's going to be great. How could you, in your right mind, in your sane <laughs> mind, Eddie Lacy's going to be great? I, I don't like doing it, but I'll agree with Todd. I totally disagree with Todd. Especially with Quain. I hate drafting next to Quain. I'm going to take, I'm just going to have that bottle of tequila right next to me. See, people should be listening to the show just to dra- like strategize around us. <laughs> All right, the 2018 NFL Draft is in the books, which means it's time to analyze some potential fantasy-relevant rookies for this upcoming 2018 season. We'll, of course, bring you some up-to-the-minute news, and we'll tell you what current NFLers, if that's a word, are winners and losers, mostly losers from the NFL Draft, like we talk about uh, Darius Geis now over... On a, um, with Washington, do any of their current guys like Chris Thompson suffer from that? But we'll talk about that later on in the show. I'm, of course, Eric Lansing, along with the usual suspects of Mikey Renault and Todd Diamond. Fellas, tonight's poker night. You guys excited for that? It's been a long time since we played poker. Jesus, yeah, I think, we're, I, think I was still in college, I think. when It hasn't been that long. That was a long time ago. It's 2000, <laughs> it was, yeah, when was that? 2013, maybe? I think maybe last time we played, 14? When did you graduate college? 2011. Yeah, okay. See, it hasn't been that long. No. It hasn't been that long. But I'm excited. Joe, uh, Joe, who we'll bring on here in a second, he's, he's a big poker player. He hasn't played in any other poker leagues. But uh, excited for that tonight to be up late, drink, and then try to stay awake after midnight. Always tougher when you get older. That's for sure. That's true. So as we mentioned, we have a special guest with us on today's show, and that is our defending, reigning MHA champion and Joe Vaccarelli. Joe, thanks for being with us on the show. He's calling in from Grand Junction. Hey. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Oh, man, it's so much fun to have you. I mean, it's it's fun to have you on. It's not fun that you won and we didn't. That's always really tough to have to deal with. But, you know, I was trying to find – our website's down, so sometimes, like, I'll try to go back and look things up. And do you remember when you came into the league, what year? Uh, I think it was, like, 2008. Right on the money. I, I, I think that's where it was. Cause I had to look it up through emails and just <laughs> find I out. Remember, yeah. Yeah, last year at Metro State. I think uh, I think that was my first draft. And we're doing the first draft in the uh, newsroom there at the Met. Yeah, at the Met. Met Media is what they call it now. But, yeah, it's almost 10 years. You know, that was the last time I won a title, Mikey. It was 2008. Oh, it was a yeah. long time ago. Ooh, yeah. Ages ago. <laughs> oh. I got three in the first, five, like, what, eight years. And then since then has been terrible. So we're, we're bringing on Joe. He's going to stay on and talk to us about some analysis stuff. But we're going to give him a chance to brag talk about how great his season was. So I'll ask him a couple questions. And uh, for, for you, Joe, winning that Tiki Trophy, which I still haven't given you yet, uh, but you've been in the league, as you mentioned, a long time. Were you excited? What were some of your thoughts? I mean, you're a big fantasy football player, so for having to wait nine years to get your first title, were you excited? What, what were some of your thoughts once you realized you finally came up with the highest point total over our fellow uh, friend here, Miguel? Yeah, I was. Uh, I mean, I feel like I had had some decent teams or teams I thought were set up pretty good, and just you know, either fizzled out in the playoffs or you know, didn't didn't really work out down the stretch and didn't make the playoffs. But um, I don't know. This year, I never really felt that great about my team, but uh, I guess so that's I guess fitting that that the year works out. Oh, so it's for beating Mikey. Like, I mean, I feel like that's <laughs> the first time I ever beat him in like the nine years. So, I mean, I guess it's good that it happens in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't give him too much credit. I mean, his ego is already – it's hard to fill up. we got this big poker room now with half – like three-quarters of his, his head in here just because that's how, you know, he walks around. But, yeah, it was great to get – in order to be the, ch- be the champion, you got to beat the champion, right? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Mikey, I, I'm Mikey a humble loser. Number. <laughs> right? I'm a humble loser. Yeah. You're a humble loser? Uh-huh. No, that is no. – no, not even in your vocabulary. <laughs> uh, so, Joe, kind of talk about your team. I know I, I helped you draft a couple of the – 
First pick, so I get some of that trophy. I'm going to cut off just a piece. I'll, I'll take off Tiki Trophy's hand and stick it on one of my other ones. But uh, you were nervous. I know you were talking to me like, Eric, you drafted too many running backs to start <laughs> off. But those two running backs and Fournette and then Kareem Hunt really kind of propelled you to, the, to that championship. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I did give you a list if I remember correctly, that you adhered very strictly to. I, very strictly. I was like, oh, he wants running back. Oh, he wants running back. Oh, he wants running back. It oh, didn't well, even think. Strictly to, yeah. I mean, but it ended <laughs> up working out. Cause I think when I, when I saw Tyree Kill as my number one wide receiver, I was a little bit, uh, a little nervous. But he ended up being worthy of a, number, of a number one receiver. I think he was in the top ten in the overall points. So that worked out. I think having two really good running backs and uh Fournette worked out well. Um, Jay Ajayi was actually the first running back that he took for me. He was kind of a bust. I had Drew Brees, who was always consistent, even though I think it was kind of a down year for him. Well, that was what's funny when I would look back at your team is like, wow, Drew Brees didn't have his Drew Brees type season, but yet he still won with Drew Brees. So go figure that. Yeah. I mean, he was still in the top five. <laughs> yes, he was still very good. Still very good. And Tyreek Hill finished seventh amongst our wide receivers in our system. And you had two top eight running backs in Fournette. And Kareem Hunt, Kareem Hunt finished third overall, which was just incredible uh, for rookies. And so um, do you remember kind of the day I, I know like people like I know you're a big fantasy football guy. I'm a big fantasy football guy. Me and Mike, you're just living off every single point. Are, are, were you busy that day working and not having to worry about it? Or were you living on every play as the day kind of went along? No, I was actually I was actually in another Super Bowl that day. So I was at the Trent Brent's house. Uh, we were watching games because we were facing off in the league, um, which uh, Brent and my, or we, Eric and Mikey, you guys know him from uh, Bicker Boys, our other league. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he ended up beating me in that league, so that was kind of disappointing. But I was following along on our matchup, uh, mine with Mikey. And um, I know I was kind of off to a good start because Mikey played, I think, two Vikings in that awful Green Bay. <laughs> He's shaking his game. head. And, <laughs> I think he had a total of like eight points. Well, one of them was a quarterback, so it was probably a little more than that. But he was, I felt like I was in pretty good shape going in. And I remember in the afternoon, he had a little late charge with Larry Fitzgerald having about 20 points. But uh, didn't quite get enough to where I think I even had to worry about it going into the Monday night game. Wow. So pretty impressive there. Mikey, uh, I know we kind of talked to you about that day, but I mean, yeah, that, that Viking thing just must have stunk to high heaven to have a quarterback not be able to kind of give you the type of day that at least an average quarterback would have at least kept you in it or maybe help you win it. It's my fault. I should have known to play Jimmy Garoppolo against the Jaguars <laughs> defense, right? Yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> that should never happen. But that's, that's how championships are. It, just, you, it doesn't matter. Fantasy football is kind of random. We can do as much research as we possibly can, look at all the variables, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's what's great about fantasy football, though. So were there any moments for you, Joe? Like, a, was there a major, like, free agent pickup? I mean, you know, I have your draft right in front of me. So, I mean, yeah, you talked about Breeze, Fournette, Hunt, Hill, Greg Olson, Crowder, Cobb, just looking through your lineup. But was there, like, a free agent guy? Or when, when did you realize you had a good team this year? Um, I think when I just kept winning. I don't know. What it was. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. But, winning is uh, the most important thing. I think uh, I think it was just a, I just had a good balanced team. I had you know two running backs that produced big points. Uh, you know I had Tyree Kill who ended up having a good year, and then I think I picked up Robbie Anderson. I was going to say you must have had a, sec a better too. second a wide receiver, and yeah, Robbie Anderson ended up having a good year. Yeah, I think I just got lucky right there. I think having Hill do what he did, having Anderson have a decent year, even on a bad Jets team. It's not and luck, yeah, Joe. This is time for you no. to brag. Like, I knew it. As soon as I picked him up, he was going to take me to a championship. Time to brag it out, Joe. Well, I just assume <laughs> I'm always going to do well. So maybe, maybe not assuming is what, what did it for me. I did pick up Gates on the last week of the season, knowing Hunter Henry was out, I think, and uh, he ended up having a good week. Yes, he did. That was the only time I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mikey's still a little bitter. So we uh, that's a big reason we appreciate you winning it, because Mikey has to be a little more humble than he usually is during the offseason. Right, Miguel? <laughs> yep, Look, he's speechless. He has nothing to, <laughs> nothing to say. Well, Joe, congratulations on that. I, I, you've been in the league a long time. We appreciate you're a hardworking fantasy guy. You're always out there looking to make your team better. And so when like, good guys like that have come through, we, we'll give you a stand-up standing ovation for sure. So great job so this season. Of course, of course. Wow. Thank you. So, so Joe's going to stick around. We're going to talk a lot about 
some news. There's a lot of news since the last time we had this podcast. Extra, extra, read all about it. Extra, extra, read all about it. The first thing we'll talk about is how about C.J. Anderson in the worst possible spot if you're a Christian McCaffrey fan. He's now in, over there in Carolina. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about C.J. Anderson in the last month's show, but now that he's on his team, we can kind of broaden our scope a little bit here. Uh, Mikey, what kind of fantasy impact do you see with C.J. Anderson now playing behind, or I guess behind the line of scrimmage, behind Cam Newton over there now? Um, I, he's not going to be as good as he was here in Denver. Sure. He's just going to slide into that same kind of role that Jonathan Stewart had. So, I mean, you're looking at, you know, 600 yards, maybe five to six touchdowns. To me, I don't – I expect him to be okay, but just okay. Just okay. Nothing magical. He's not going to go out there and run for another 1,000 yards. And no way. Maybe eight mm-hmm. touchdowns. No not way. at all. No not way. seeing that at all. He's, he's injury no. prone too. That's, he is. He is. Yeah, I don't see it. So, uh, Todd, what do you think in terms of C.J. Anderson coming over? Is that going to hurt Christian McCaffrey and what he does for this team? Last year, Christian McCaffrey finished uh, 11th overall in our – System. He only had 427 yards rushing, but 75 catches, uh, seven total touchdowns. Obviously, in PPR, that's big. But do you see those fantasy stats going down with C.J. Anderson there? I think until Cam Newton realizes he doesn't have to do everything by himself, because Cam Newton still was a leading rusher last year with 754 yards rushing. I just think C.J. Anderson is just going to be another Jonathan Stewart situation where you'll maybe at the goal line, maybe you'll – You'll hand the ball off to him. McCaffrey still, still kind of the, obviously the dual threat, uh, you know, running back that that the Panthers drafted him for. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't see, I don't see McCaffrey getting hurt or you know or benefiting anyway um, fr- from C.J. Anderson in the backfield because as long as Cam Newton is still, you know, when your quarterback is your leading rusher, it it it. it in that sense, it hurt. It hurts your running backs. It hurts your running backs. So I don't, I don't, I don't see this move helping or hurting McCaffrey's um, stock right now. Um, he, like I said, he still catches. He still caught seventy-five passes, which is which is great. Um, obviously, Norv Turner now is in in um, uh, Carolina, so maybe that'll, maybe he'll get Cam Newton to say, listen, you. You don't have to, like, run every single time. Like, try to be a pocket passer. So that might open the running game a little bit for C.J. Anderson. But until I see that actually happen, I don't see this move helping or hurting the Panthers in any way. Interesting. All right, so for you, Joe, uh, for Christian McCaffrey and C.J. Anderson. Now, C.J. Anderson is probably going to take the first couple of downs. Christian McCaffrey coming in at third down. Who are you drafting first between the two? Oh, I think it's easily McCaffrey. Yeah. I mean, I think C.J. Anderson maybe is a running back, maybe a backup running back flex some days. But I think McCaffrey is going to be a high-end running back, too. Um, definitely going McCaffrey, especially in our league with the points per reception, 80, 80 passes, was it? 75? Yeah, 75. Last year. Yeah, five touchdowns, I think. So, yeah, I mean, definitely going McCaffrey. He's going to be, he's going to be the consistent point producer in that backfield, I think. So last year, McCaffrey went in the third round in our draft. Where do you think – I'm assuming Chris McCaffrey is going to go around that same range. Where do you think C.J. Anderson goes then? Are we talking late, like in the sixth, seventh round? I mean, he is a starting running back, and those guys hard to come by, especially late in the draft. So are we think, still thinking about drafting him as our, as our number two, number three, or is he going to be like Joe said, kind of more of like a bench guy? Anybody I, can chime in. I, I would mm. use the word starter very loosely – Sure. Uh, because he's starting the game, but he's not getting the most snaps. So, yeah, if you want to go 8th, ninth, 10th round, somewhere around there. Oh, you think that late for yeah. C.J. Anderson? Yeah. Oh, I say 11. I say wow. I, 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 I think I, you guys I are smoking this, dope and uh, showing man. early here. Yeah. I think it's really late for a guy that's going to be in there pretty, pretty early in the game and, and, and going to be the goal line back outside, obviously with Cam, that hurts a little bit, yeah. but, but I think it would take like an injury too, maybe for, for Anderson stock to go up maybe too. If, if there, you know, if McCaffrey somehow got hurt, like in preseason or something like that, then I would say, then maybe, and maybe CJ's stock goes up a little bit, maybe like Mikey said, maybe eight or ninth round then. But other than that, you know, 11th round or even toward the end of the draft. So 
Do you want to say something? I agree with Todd. Okay. Wow. That doesn't happen very often. Mikey agreeing with Todd. (laughs) All right. So there's C.J. Anderson talk. Let's keep moving this show along. Uh, Dallas Cowboys tight end Jason Witten, obviously one of the top fantasy tight ends ever in the history of fantasy football. He retires after 15 very productive years in the NFL. Caught 1,152 catches, uh, which is fourth most, most in history, which means it's time for MHA Trivia. Hey! Hey! Now, are you just saying you want to have fun, or do you really want to have fun? I really want to have fun. I'm just saying I want to have some fun. <laughs> How exciting is that? So, fourth all-timer receptions. Who are the top three guys? This might be the easiest MHA trivia of all time. Uh, uh, we'll let Joe tr- uh, give me an answer first, and then we can go around the room. Uh, well, Jerry Rice. All right, Jerry Rice is the number one. Mikey, do you know who number two or number three is? Say Tony Gonzalez. That is correct. Todd, can you finish off this trifecta? I'd say ooh, Terrell Owens. Eh, that oh, is man. incorrect. Joe, do you know who number three is on that list? Ooh, is it Moss? Not Moss. Mikey? I'd say Larry Fitzgerald. Ding, ding. There you go. So it's Rice, Gonzalez, Larry Fitzgerald, who when he goes in the Hall of Fame should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. And so that is your MHA trivia. So that, that was just some notes about Jason Witten. Uh, how about a guy who's going to be around for a little while longer? Matt Ryan signs a five-year extension. He is the first $30 million a year player, $100 million guaranteed. He is the fastest quarterback in NFL history to reach 40,000 yards. Will he be drafted as a starter next season for our league? Mikey, what do you think? Who as a starter? Yeah, I could see that. They, they added a new weapon. I, yeah, I can see that. Todd, last year, Matt Ryan finished 16th. He only had 3,700 yards passing, 19 total passing touchdowns, and 12 interceptions. Is he good? Would you draft him as one of your – I mean, your starting quarterback, even if you were the last one to draft a quarterback, would he be a guy you draft number 12? I would. I would. Um, he, obviously, he has the weapons around him. Um, and I think, too, the defense – He had a lot of weapons last year and only had 19 total touchdowns. I think, too, that's... I mean, is Calvin Ridley going to... I mean, we'll talk about Calvin Ridley, but is he really going to come in and he's going to throw for 30 touchdowns and 5,000 yards next season? It seems like it's pretty cyclical with Matt Ryan. One year, he's great. Another year, he's back down to earth. Another year, he's great. Well, is this going to be that kind of the, the year next year is going to be great type of scenario? I would think so. I think now maybe sometimes like obviously when teams pay their quarterbacks all, you know, the, you know, King's ransom to, to, to stay, sometimes like, oh, well, I don't have to try anymore. I can just, you know, I have my money. But Matt Ryan, I don't think that type of player. So I think now he's, he, he's got his money now. He just wants to win a Super Bowl. So I think that's going to motivate him now even more to – to, to put up big numbers, and I'm a little biased because he did help me win a championship. <laughs> Joe, what do you think about Matt Ryan? Is he on your fantasy scope? I mean, this is probably the deepest quarterback class that I've, that I've ever seen, that most people have ever seen. Is Matt Ryan kind of a guy you're gearing towards? I don't know. I don't, I don't like Matt Ryan because he's so frustrating. <laughs> um, yes. I feel like the years I've had him that he did well, or I took him as a backup and ended up starting it. Um, so I'm going to look to go that route again and, you know, take him as a backup and see if maybe he pans out, especially if I took a, another quarterback fairly, fairly late. Do you think Matt Ryan deserves that money? I mean, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough question, right? They're I mean, to pay him, I guess. yeah, it just keeps going up. He's going to be the highest paid quarterback now. So are, are we I don't saying, think he will be for long. I think yeah. Aaron Rodgers will be. Oh, yeah, for sure. Next season, Aaron Rodgers will be if anybody deserves it, Aaron Rodgers does, yeah. does for sure. So there's Matt Ryan uh, making a lot of money. Uh, I wish I was a quarterback. All right, let's get into this to really a great player to a non-great player. I just thought this was funny, so I'm bringing this up. Everyone's favorite tight end, Kobe Fleener, was released by the Saints. No surprise there. We all thought he would be the next Jimmy Graham. At least some of us did. After so Don't point – yeah, maybe point at me. Yeah, I was definitely on, on that list. Uh, he, he had some productive years in Indianapolis but didn't have any with the Saints. Last year had 22 receptions and 11 games, just two touchdowns. Uh, went on the IR with a concussion. I just wanted to bring it up because I thought it was funny because, you know, tight ends suck and they continue to suck. And we thought maybe he'd not suck, but he sucked. All right, let's <laughs> I'm just keep moving along. 
Uh, now here's something we can really talk about, and that is Mark Ingram. Oh, man. Currently suspended for the first four games of the season. Now I say currently because the thing I wrote, read a couple days ago is that the situation states that he failed a test, but it wasn't for performing enhancing drugs. The reports say that whatever he failed in that test can be something that can be admissible by the NFL, thus being able to use it with their permission. Kind of like Adderall, but they didn't, we, don't, we do not know, at least I do not know, what that actual failed test was for. So we're going to talk as if he is suspended for the first four games. Uh, Joe, I'll start with you. Actually, no, I'm not going to start with you, Joe, because you have the value pick question. So I'm going to start with Todd. Uh, does the f- four games that Ingram will miss move him down in your rankings? I think a little bit, just because Kamara really showed like he can carry the load. Even though I know they split, they split time last year, but since Kamara can catch the ball in our league as PPR, I think the value goes up a little bit. Now, after saying that, a little bit for four mm-hmm. games? Now, I did see something that he, he has never had more than 12 carries in a game last year. Now, obviously, you think that would go up unless they bring someone else to, to, to help kind of defer those carries and take some of the bulk away from him. But I think Kamara's value shoots through the roof in those first four games. He's going to be the guy that's going to get all the catches because Mark Ingram's a very good pass catcher himself. But he's not as good as Kamara. No, but he's still yeah. solid. I mean, he still yeah. gets you 50 catches a year. I'm, I, that's nothing to sniff at. No. So, I mean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I just think Kamara's value whoosh, for the first four games is going to be through the roof. That was my little Kramer impression. Yeah. Terrible. Well, no, well, I'm just saying of where I would – where I would draft Ingram, because I think with Ingram, with the four ga- even without the four games, I'd st- I wouldn't draft him very high. I wouldn't draft Ingram really? very high. I know, you know, obviously that way that offense is constructed, you know, w- w- why not? But I just think now with this four-game suspension, it kind of, you know, I-, I would really have to draft another good running back behind Ingram to make – you know, just for those four games. Because let's face it, in our league, you know, f- four, ga- four games and you're, you're not doing very well, that's like a death sentence. Like, you're, you're you know, you, you, you got to make sure. You, if it was like two or three, then I would draft Ingram probably right up there, probably in the third or fourth round. So if anybody knows anything about death sentence, it's Todd and his fantasy baseball team. Oh, yeah. He's just well, been that's... terrible this year. <laughs> yeah. Mikey, oh, um, you can give me your thoughts on Ingram, but I also want to know, does that – officially move Alvin Kamara into our first round? Or do you think he was I, there before? I think he was there before. That is incredible to me. But go ahead. I mean, he was third overall in our league with all running backs and receivers. He was somebody that was averaging, you know, over 15 points a game. Yeah. And that's with getting 12 carries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, adding on that first four games, if it even increases him a little bit, oh, he's a slam dunk first rounder, no doubt about it. How high in the first round? I'm gonna throw you on the spot. Oh boy! Like where? Um, I know that's tough because so you don't have to give me a definite, but like about where? Are we talking like seven or eight? Or are we talking? That's about right. Seven or eight yeah. at, at that point, where maybe AJ Green or Odell Beckham, or you, you take Kamara over guys like that? Yeah, I would wow. say so. Whew. Would you take him over Ezekiel Elliott or even? You mean dare dare say Le'Veon Bell? No, no way. way. No, Get no out way. of here, Todd. <laughs> Joe. Uh, kind of talking with this uh, Mark Ingram deal, can Ingram be a value pick? And you can give us your thoughts on this whole scenario too, but with Ingram, it sounds like he's going to fall. Where would you kind of draft him, or would you avoid him altogether? I wouldn't avoid him altogether, no way. I mean, I think once he comes back, he's going to be the fresh leg. He's going to have fresh leg. Kamara's never really carried a load like that before. I, I don't know necessarily if they'll move him out of the role he's already in. They might just bring in another back but it's probably one who's not going to be as effective as Ingram. Well, what about Kamara? Is he first round for sure? I think he was in May. I'd say probably late first round, maybe between 8 and 10. Wow. Uh, just with Ingram, uh, he ended up finishing fifth in points in our league. Uh, Kamara, and I have it based on before the championship, so I have Kamara fourth overall on how we finished. Just think about this. For Mark Ingram, for those who do like him, and, I, and I've always kind of been a fan of his, but – let's say he misses the first four weeks. He also will miss, the obviously, the bye week. Everybody misses that for the team. But week six is the bye week, so that's another week. And then right after that, for a schedule at Baltimore, at Minnesota, versus L.A., at Cincinnati, and versus Philly. 
Those are some tough. I don't know much about Cincinnati, but those are some tough defenses for sure. So think about that if you're going to try Mark Ingram. Then once he gets back, and I also uh, I was listening to a podcast. So I'm not going to take credit for this, but in his first four games last year, he was terrible. He was, he averaged 42 yards per game in those first four games and zero touchdowns. So it took him four games to kind of get going. And now he's going to come off that suspension. Yes, fresh legs, but then he's got those really tough, really tough. And I, and I think the thing that I think we're missing, too, I was thinking about this when Todd was talking, is like how much of his in the doghouse is he with Sean Payton now? Like I feel Sean Payton is one of those guys, like if you're in his doghouse, it's going to be rough going for you. And we've seen that before with running backs and Tim Hightower and all those guys. So we'll see how much this really changes things. But that's some Mark Ingram it, talk. It makes you like Drew Brees those first four weeks, doesn't it? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. He's going to be throwing a lot to Kamara, apparently, and then Michael Thomas. All right, so, so that's kind of the news and notes. We're going to rapid fire some of these other uh, news and notes here, and we'll start with Todd. And when I say rapid fire, Todd, not like 10 minutes, maybe a couple at the most. Okay. Like, like, you got like that? More like five minutes. If I have to throw something at you, it's not going to sound good on radio. Sweet. All right, so for, for Doug Martin, finished his time in Tampa, will now be taking carries in Oakland. Is Martin even fantasy relevant? What kind of numbers do you think he'll put up on the board? Uh, Marshawn Lynch is still there, so I really don't see. I really don't see it. he's injury prone. Um, but I'd say maybe 500 yards rushing and maybe two or three t- uh, touchdowns um, if he gets to the goal line. But that's. But I think uh, Gruden's going to just. He he wants Marshawn Lynch to be the bell cow. Mike, you shaking his head. Go ahead. I'll give you. I'll give you a little time to reply here since you're. Oh God, you got something to say. Right. What is Marshawn Lynch like? Forty. He, he's, he's, no, he's not a bell cow anymore. Look, this is what John Gruden does. He likes having his, you know, his big goal line back, which will be Lynch. And then he likes having his receiving back. Back in Oakland, they, and even in Tampa, they liked having that guy out of the backfield. Their passing game is their running game. Doug Martin's that Charlie Garner. Marshawn Lynch is the Tyrone Wheatley. That's oh, kind of how it works. <laughs> Tyrone Wheatley. Didn't expect to hear his yeah. name on the uh, broadcast today. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. So, I, I mean, so do you like his numbers then? I mean, there are other guys also. And we could talk about Lynch and – there's, some, there's other guys on the team, I, too, I that are going to eat it up carries. True. I think there's going to be some upside for PPR for him. We're going to talk about Deion Lewis in Tennessee. Now, as someone who I'm in a league with Joe and with Mikey in the Bicker Boys League, and I have Derrick Henry, and I almost traded him. I was like, no, he's going to be great. And now Deion Lewis comes in, and I'm pissed. <laughs> but tell me, Mikey, what your thoughts of Deion Lewis. In, is he, what kind of numbers do you expect, and does that hurt Derrick, Derrick Henry's value at the end of the day? Well, I don't think it hurts his value too much. It's not like Derrick Henry was catching passes anyway. No, sure, but so we don't know. <laughs> Didn't have the chance. Maybe he has the ability. Now we'll never know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Super pissed. That's right. No, I still think you know Derrick Henry is going to be that first and second down guy, and Lewis will be the third down guy. So I think it's actually going to hurt Lewis's numbers in a way from what he was doing in New England because the whole entire second half of the season, it was you that had Lewis, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he was awesome. Yeah. The Patriots were starting to use him like as their main guy, and he was getting rushing carries. He was getting carries at the goal line. He was still catching passes. In Tennessee, I don't really see him doing all of that. I think he'll still be a good third-down guy. He'll still get catches, probably like 40 to 50. But I think Henry's the main guy. So I should still be okay? I should be I as I think missed. you should be okay. <laughs> you saw what Henry did in the playoffs. He looked Oh, really he was good. so good. He was so good. Yeah. He was brilliant out there. It was fun to watch. So, Joe, we now go move uh, from Minnesota, from a guy that went from Minnesota to San Francisco. Jarek McKinnon will take his 570 rushing yards, 51 receptions, and five touchdowns to over there in the Bay Area with Carlos Hyde out of the picture. Do you like McKinnon at all? Is he someone that, you know, if you get him in a good spot, he's going to produce fantasy value, or maybe you're all over him? I don't know. You tell me. I do like him. I think he's going to be... I think he's a solid running back, too. He's got some running back one potential upside, at least. I think you always like a guy going into a draft where you know someone's the number one guy established, and you know that's not going to hopefully not going to change barring injury. Uh, Carlos Hyde, if you look at his numbers last year, he did a uh, he had what almost 50 catches, almost a thousand yards, eight yeah. touchdowns. I mean, if if McKinnon can approach that, I mean, I think you're going to be pretty happy. And especially, I think he's not going to be looked at as a number one back going into the draft. So I think a number number two back with a uh, number one potential. 
Should, should, and I'm just going to throw this question at you on the spot. Should we be excited about 49ers offense this year with Garoppolo, Pierre Garçon, and now Jarek McKinnon here? Is, that, is this an offense we should be excited about, or is it we're just average on? I think when you look at Garoppolo's play at the end of last year, I think it's something that's intriguing for sure, uh, especially with Kyle Shanahan there. I think that, you know, I don't know about Pierre Garçon so much anymore <laughs> being excited about him, but um, – but, yeah, no, I think that's definitely an offense to watch. And maybe somebody somebody else emerges in their wide receiver for that, you know, can kind of complement that offense a little bit more. So the San Francisco 49ers could be fantasy relevant. Definitely interesting to see. All right, so you guys ready to talk about some rookies? Hey. Guys that haven't failed and people are so excited about. I, especially after what we kind of saw last year with how successful, especially running backs, rookies can be. So – for those who listened to our podcast before, we talked about Saquon Barkley. We talked about make Baker Mayfield. So we're not going to talk about, I think, the first seven or eight picks, I think, is where we finished the broadcast. So we're going to kind of start from there. We're not going to get to everybody. We're about half, like about half hour through this show. So we'll get to as many as we possibly can. And uh, so we'll kind of do it this way. I'm going to throw out some quarterbacks, and then you guys can tell me which of those quarterbacks you like or whatever position we're going to talk about. So we'll start with the QB position. Uh, Josh Rosen in Arizona, uh, taken with the 10th pick, was tr- traded up to grab him. Uh, so there's Josh Rosen in Arizona. Uh, the final pick in the first round, Louisville quarterback Lamar Jackson to the Ravens. Obviously, you have RG3 and Joe Flacco over there. Uh, and another guy that was drafted, Mason Rudolph from Oklahoma State. 76 overall pick by Pittsburgh. Maybe the error apparent to Ben Roethlisberger. Obviously, quarterbacks don't use. Not a lot of them make a huge difference, but out of those three guys, because we talked about those other guys in the previous show, do they do they excite you at all for this year? Anybody can go. Yeah, Rosen for sure. He's in the I think he's in the best situation. He's got he's got one of the best running backs in in the league. Yeah, he's got a Hall of Fame wide receiver to throw to. He's got a great defense behind him. Yeah, Josh Rosen for sure. Because Lamar Jackson might sit just depending on if if Joe even if Joe unless Joe Flacco gets hurt. And Mason Rudolph, obviously, B- Big Ben didn't have a whole lot of good, uh, nice things to say right off the bat uh, about him when they drafted him. So um, Josh Rosen, because he, he's, he's probably going to start. He's probably going to start. Um, you think uh, he starts one. over Sam B- Bradford oh, on week one? Oh, are you kidding me? Sam Bradford gets hurt just, walk, just walking out his door. So, <laughs> you know, uh, no, it's, it's going to be Rosen. It's going to be Rosen. Because I think, if, I mean, if, if he if, – if he if he wows in preseason, how can you how can you not? And and the fact that the Cardinals have good supporting cast around him, why not go with the minus the offensive line? But right. and that's well, the scariest part about Josh Rosen is he's gonna be running for his life unless he hands the ball off to David Johnson on every every opportunity because I think that's what's gonna suffer and that's what makes anybody. Yeah scared or just frightful to put in their young quarterback. You don't want to destroy his confidence no. in the early stages no. when you have no uh, ability to even stand in the pocket because there is none. But he's more mobile than Sam Bradford at this, at this okay. stage. So I'll that, give you that. That's probably a good point. <laughs> they, they do have Is 20 million. more mobile than Sam Bradford? <laughs> That's true. They've got 20 million reasons to put Sam Bradford in the lineup, even if it's just to get him injured. <laughs> okay, so, so out of those guys, would you, would you prefer Jackson then? Do you think Jackson has an easier road with – Joe Flacco there, and we had this conversation, I think, off of air. We were talking about, well, they brought in RG3 to kind of work in kind of in comparison with Lamar Jackson, a very mobile quarterback, because Joe Flacco could be on his way out soon, or he's one injury away from them to try something new with these two mobile quarterbacks. Yeah, Lamar Jackson's the most intriguing for me, Okay, just because you kind of saw a similar skill set with Deshaun Watson and what he did, but the problem with Lamar Jackson is, is I don't know how short the leash actually is on Joe Flacco. So sure. to Todd's point, I think it would take an injury or unless the Ravens at that point were just like one in five or something like that to get Flacco out. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's stale watching or uh, Ravens offense. It's stale outside of uh, maybe the running game. Oh, the wide receivers just, just go to die. What do you think, Joe? Do you like any of these guys? Uh, no, not no. really. Uh, <laughs> I guess I agree with both Mikey and Todd. I think Rosen's in the best situation. He has the best chance to play this year. I think Jackson's the most intriguing talent. I don't think Mason Rudolph's going to play for at least a couple of years. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are not guys I would really even target. 
but this year at least. But maybe a deep keeper league, you know, flyer. I think Mason Rudolph was drafted just to make sure that Big Ben stayed a couple more years. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just to kind of, you know, irk him a little bit. If he's upset about it, maybe he gets motivated to play. But, yeah, usually with quarterbacks – even the guys who do play, they don't put up huge fantasy stats. And with quarterback position as deep, it is, as, deep as it is, uh, we'll probably never even look at these guys through the season. Uh, so, but we've got to talk about it. We're fantasy, right? We've got to bring it up. Uh, so let's talk about a sexier position. We should put some sexy music on right now. <laughs> some sexy positions. But let's talk about running back. Last year, we saw a plethora of great first-year running backs come in and be incredibly productive uh, we talked about him, Alvin Kamara, Kareem Hunt, Leonard Fournette. Man, so many great names. And we're not going to mention Barkley on this broadcast. We already talked about him. So I'm going to go through these. I'm going to mention each running back, and then we'll kind of go back and talk to him. So uh, just going to catch you guys up. San Diego State running back Rashad Penny, 27th pick uh, by Seattle, kind of a workhorse back. Sorge, uh, Georgia has uh, notorious for putting out incredible running backs, Sony Michel. Uh, he goes to New England, which is incredibly uh, surprising to me, just because New England not usually known for drafting skill players. He was the 31st pick in the first round. The other Georgia running back, Nick Chubb, goes over to the Cleveland Browns, and boy, that's a pretty crowded backfield. Tampa Bay replaced Doug Martin, as we mentioned. Uh, now in his stead will be Ronald Jones, who comes over from USC. Uh, the Detroit Lions traded up to select Carrion Johnson, the Auburn Tiger product. A lot of three-down three back talk with him. Darius Geis, he fell a ton to the Redskins. Uh, he might have the best situation just in terms of no one else is there outside of Darius Geis. And then Royce Freeman, who uh, for us Bronco fans, uh, being uh, drafted in the third round to kind of take over C.J. Anderson, although Mikey will tell us that Devon, uh, Devontae Booker is the number one guy over there, at least currently. So out of those guys, we'll start with uh, Joe this time. Out of those guys I mentioned, who do you like the most or who do you think or who, do you, or who are you drafting early, at least at this point in time of the season? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, there's a couple guys in good situations. I think Jones. I like Jones in Tampa. I think he could be, I think he could be pretty exciting this year. Um, was it Penny? Who, who was in Seattle? Was that Penny went to Seattle? Uh, yeah, Rashad uh, Penny, yep. I think those two are the top two guys that I would look at. I mean, Chubb, you look at, you've got Carlos Hyde there, New England back. Yeah, you know, we know the history there. Uh, guys in Washington, I like, I like him as well. I think those those are the three guys I'd be looking to get my hands on at some point in the draft. So if if it was your pick, and you could pick any any one of these guys are available, is there one that sticks out to you? I'm putting a gun to your head. I know we're not drafting until August, but is it if if, if any of these guys were available, who are you drafting at that point? I'm gonna take Jones in Tampa. Okay. I think he, like I think he's I think his talent's just exciting. Um, kind of looking at like what Doug Martin did his rookie year in Tampa when he exploded. Yeah, he's kind of a slasher, kind of a juke and jiver. Uh, he was, I mean, he was a district champion in high school in the 100 meter yard dash. Uh, he had 1500 yards and 19 touchdowns. Excuse me, in his senior season, uh, he does have. I mean, maybe <laughs> I would say he's got a lot to deal with, but maybe he doesn't. You talk about Chakwiz Rogers, Charles Sims, Peyton Barber. Uh, to kind of go along with him. So Ronald Jones obviously was great in his USC career. Mikey, uh, who excites you out of this group? Is it Jones or is there someone else that kind of tickles your fancy? No, I actually agree with Joe. It is Ronald Jones. Wow, I mean, no kidding. Yeah, all the rest of those names that you just mentioned are a bunch of garbage. I mean, <laughs> Oh, you're talking about in Tampa, not right, the other running backs, right. the rookie running backs. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say, I was like, wow. I, I mean, in comparison, like take on Johnson, which you said had you know, three-down potential. Well, they brought in LeGarrette Blunt. They already Correct. had Theo Riddick. And they already had Amir Abdullah. I garbage. Mean, He's kind of garbage, garbage, too, though. Yeah, the, all, Everybody all, always seems to love him. True, true. So, but Tampa's been running with these three guys, I feel, for a couple years, too. Oh, they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> all those guys are terrible. You know, I would love to believe in Royce Freeman. I really, really would. You were kind of giving me – you were off air earlier right. this year. You were kind of talking up Royce Freeman. I, I would love to believe in him, but I don't trust Vance Joseph and, and, <laughs> and him not this playing – This is a coaching problem. Not uh -huh. playing rookies. So – yeah, I believe that he still believes that Devontae Booker is the man. So. Oh, that can't be the case. He's so uh -huh. bad. Yeah. Nick Chubb, you know, great talent, but they still got Duke Johnson there. Baker Mayfield is – or Tyrod Taylor is the quarterback. So I don't really – plus Carlos Hyde's there too, so I don't really like that either. Wow, okay. So 
two, two for two on Ronald Jones. Todd, who, who do you like out of that bunch? Who stands out to you? Geis. There's really? Geis. He, th- th- this guy was going to be a first-round draft pick, and, you know, whatever happened at the Combine, whatever. But he, he's going to be the number one back. This guy is – this guy's got the they got the speed. I mean, he runs downhill. He can, you know, he's kind of a he's kind of a little bit of a slasher too. I mean, obviously he was he was running behind Leonard Fournette two years ago at LSU, and he's proven he can be. I think he can be an every down back. So I go with Darius Geis because I've said it before and I'll say it again. Here we go. Yep, running backs are not a dime a dozen, and especially rookies. If you can find a rookie running back. Right out the gate, when there's really no no film on on him, and 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 he can, and Geis can pretty much just kind of take the league by storm a little bit in Washington and be the number one guy. Why not? So, so out of that group, that's the that's the guy you're drafting. If all of these guys are available, yes, there is okay. Geis. How and Joe, you can answer this too. How surprised were we when Seattle took Rashad Penny? Now, I am not a fantasy co- a collegiate expert like running back expert like I but I have read I read a lot obviously with our podcast I did a lot of reading this guy never even showed up on, on my list of guys and then he gets drafted in the first round now he's very productive he had 2200 rush yards in his senior season 23 touchdowns uh, 19 receptions that's not a ton but he was first team all-american and all of a sudden he's up there with Seattle are we excited about him at all, or is it just kind of the same thing we've seen with Seattle running backs the last few years where, yuck? <laughs> I mean, he's going to have opportunity, so, you know, that leads you to believe that he's worth taking a flyer on. I mean, who else is there besides Chris Carson? Right, yeah, there's not much there. Yeah, there's not. Rawls isn't there anymore, is he? No, he's gone. Yeah, so, I mean, he's worth definitely taking a look at for sure, just based on opportunity even though their offensive line is just so bad, you know. I agree with Mikey. I think he's, he's intriguing, but I don't think he's the most exciting guy on the list. Yeah, it, it was definitely strange. I know when we were watching it, we were all like, what? Who? Never heard of this guy before. They let guys like Geist yeah. drop and Sony Michelle. It was pretty incredible. Yeah, I read, a, I read a report that said he could have gone in second or third round, so they sound like kind of a reach. So, yep, Seattle saw something. Wanted to take him, tries to shore up that situation. Uh, I think I agree. I think you guys agree with me that uh, we definitely needed to <laughs> shore up the offensive line for Seattle, then worry about running backs later. But, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. They'll let Russell Wilson throw a lot more than may be necessary. So uh, anything else we want to say about these running backs? We talked about Nick Chubb a little bit. A lot going on over there with Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson. But he is a second-round pick. Do, you, do we expect him to kind of make any kind of noise this year? Is there going to be the Carlos Hyde, Duke Johnson show? I think it's just going to depend on what Nick Chubb does in you know the preseason t- as well. Because obviously Carlos Hyde is injury-prone too. So it would, so it would again, it would take an injury-prone Carlos Hyde for maybe for Nick Chubb to, you know, to step in. But you know. Maybe Cleveland's hoping maybe this will push maybe Carlos Hyde, you know, to get back to the form, you know, when he was a few years ago. Um, but other than that, I think maybe, you know, Cleveland fans are thinking, please, Nick Chubb. Because, I mean, he was very product- very productive at Georgia um, and can, you know, improve. He could, the one year he was by himself, um, he could prove that he could carry the load as well, too. So um, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, we, we don't know what Cleveland's going to do. We, we didn't know Cle- you know. Well, like, we're going to know pretty soon with them on Hard Knocks, and we'll talk about oh, yes, that yes. at the end of the show. And, Joe, you're a Bronco fan. I want, I want your thoughts on Royce Freeman, Devontae Booker, D'Angelo Henderson. I mean, does, does Royce Freeman excite you? I mean, what, what do you expect the Broncos to do? Uh, he doesn't excite me. Um, I mean, I like the fact that he got a lot of work at Oregon and was productive, but I also don't like the fact that he got a lot of work at Oregon and, <laughs> you know, probably took a big toll on his body, but um, yeah, I don't think Booker is exciting. I think Henderson might be the most intriguing back on the Broncos roster, but um, I would think that Freeman is going to start. But I expect him to kind of have a C.J. Anderson type of year if he does, which mm. is good, but not not amazing, not not super exciting. A thousand yards and five or six touchdowns. I mean, that's pretty good. But what about like the other running backs that I mean? Like, Are there other running backs on the squad? 
uh, David Williams we drafted in the seventh round, and then we picked up Philip Lindsay from uh, no. CU. Okay. No way. I mean, no. <laughs> I'm just no. saying with <laughs> no. the Broncos have a good track record when it comes to those those late late picks of making an impact. I'm just I'm just saying, but I mean it probably won't happen. But I'm just saying yeah, under Mike Shanahan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. yeah, 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 you're right, Joe. You're right. Yeah, Mike Shanahan's not walking through that door. Why Mike not? Shanahan was still doing? coaching. And he'd be like, oh, David Williams and Philip <laughs> Lindsay. Oh, there are starting running backs right there. All right, so that, it'll be interesting. The running, the Broncos may throw 500 times this year. That's gonna be interesting how that rolls out. Let's talk about some wide receivers here as we're coming down to last like 10 minutes or so of this show. I'm gonna go through these and then we'll talk about them. DJ Moore, Maryland, uh, now over in Carolina. He was a first round pick, uh, six foot, 210 pounds. Uh, you talk about Calvin Ridley. We mentioned him a little bit. Uh, one of my favorite picks went to Atlanta uh, with a 26th overall pick in the first round. He's six one. Uh, Cortland Sutton, speaking of Broncos, he was a second-round pick. Uh, he's 6'3", came out as a junior. San Francisco bolstered their wide receiving core. See, there's a lot to talk about in San Francisco offense. Da- Dante Pettis from the University of Washington. Uh, Christian Kirk, Arizona's second-round pick from Texas A&M. He's 5'11", scored 40 total t- touchdowns in his career. Uh, to go along with recent free agent signee Allen Robinson, the Bears used their second-round pick on Memphis wide receiver Anthony Miller. And finally, James Washington from Oklahoma State. He was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers, who traded away Martavis Bryant. And we could talk about the Bryant thing, too, if we want, uh, as Br- uh, Bryant now with the Raiders. So Washington uh, selected in that second round. Uh, Mikey, out of these guys, is, is there anyone that stands out or gets you excited about possibly drafting him now? The last couple of years, the wide receiver position has not been favorable to the fantasy world, for sure. Uh, obviously, I drafted Corey Davis, hoping he was going to do something, and he finally did in playoff times when it didn't matter, unless you play in Joe's or, I guess, Brent's fantasy playoff league. But in terms of regular season, any of these guys kind of jump out to you? Wow, oh. that is quite the look on Mikey's face. Gosh, it just seems like it takes these receivers a little bit to get going, except for maybe the slot guys. Yeah. So, you know. So there's a good slot guy situation in there. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Christian Kirk, I kind of like him. Arizona doesn't really have too much outside of Fitzgerald. Yeah, they got so rid of some of those slot guys, yeah, like the Browns of yeah, the world. Yeah, That one seems to make the most sense to me. Uh, Cortland Sutton, I'm not really enamored with at all at Denver, at least not early on. They still have Sanders and Demarius Thomas. Mm. I actually think that the – He can't you know, be a number three guy? I, I actually think that Deshaun Hamilton's going to be the really? number three guy for Denver. There you go. The slot. Yeah, so I – I like him better. Anthony Miller, I mean, Chicago, they, yeah, they have Allen Robinson. He might be a potential. He's a burner, too. So, I mean, I think he may be a decent pick. James Washington, uh, God, they got so many people there in <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm not really enamored with any of these guys, but Christian Kirk, I believe, has the best chance out of all of them. Todd, what do you think? Anybody Anthony, on here? Anthony Miller, just because okay. there's nobody else in Chicago for Trubisky to, th- to throw the ball you to. You guys, what? we had this conversation <laughs> last show, but what is you guys' affinity for Mitchell Trubisky? Is he that good? I didn't really see anything great from him. Now it's his rookie year. I want to be an a-hole about it. But, man, I just don't believe, from what I saw, like he's going to be a guy that's going to throw for 30 touchdowns. I mean, he'll throw 20, 22, 23 because – Quarter, starting quarterbacks do, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just not. I'm not looking at him in a in a very good light. But go ahead. I think he just. I think he just got potential. I mean, I know a lot of people like his his tape at Carolina wasn't great, but I think there was just there was a lot of like raw potential there to to mold him into a great quarterback. So that's why that's why I think he you know I, I, he just didn't have any weapons around him. So maybe. Seeing it from the naked eye, I was like, "Well, what's so special about it?" Well, you put some good weapons around him, start you know building around him, then maybe you can see you know what is. I I get it. Like first year when teams draft quarterbacks, they don't have like all the great talent around, you know, uh, around their rookie quarterback as much as they try. So as Mikey is writing something, yeah, Mikey just wrote, "John Fox is gone." <laughs> so the upside of the offense is. Yeah. Uh, is lifted a little bit now, but yeah, but I see I, that. But I think in year two, I think you know, start. I mean, I think getting Allen Robinson first was a big step. You know, get him a, a proven wide receiver that can help him, and then Anthony Miller, who, you know, five five eleven, you know, he caught he caught ninety five uh, ninety five receptions, fourteen thirty thirteen hundred yards receiving, and fourteen touchdowns last year. 
at Memphis. So that's a pre- that's a pretty good tagline, and I do agree with Mike. He, he is the, he's kind of like a burner too, so that kind of offsets a little bit. So you have Allen Ro- Robinson as your you know your big wide receiver. You can throw the ball up to in the red zone, and then you got your burner in Miller. So I think that'll help Trubinsky a lot. What do you think, Joe? If you're looking at this list and they and they come up, is there anybody that, that just like just stands out amongst the rest? It kind of stands out, but I like DJ Moore a little bit. I mean, okay, if you Carolina, I think they need a they need a wide receiver, I and mean, they have the good back out of the backfield. They can catch balls with Caffrey, the security blank tight end, and Bolton. But I've never really been that excited about Devin Funchess. So I feel like if they Carolina needs down the field options, and maybe DJ Moore can be it. Maybe like a I mean, I saw something online about comparing him to Steve Smith. I don't know. That's obviously premature. But, um, you know, if they can get something decent out of a wide receiver, they haven't got anything out of a wide receiver since Kelvin Benjamin for the year, it seems like. Yeah, for sure. And wasn't it Steve Smith that said he reminded him of Steve Smith? That's pretty interesting, right? (laughs) That's why Carolina brought in Torrey Smith, huh? Where are those believers? Yeah, yeah, can you guys name the other wide receivers outside of Devin Funchess? Well, yeah, I know Torrey Smith is one of them. Okay. Uh, I didn't see him on the roster, though. Are you sure? Oh, okay. Um, I may have missed him. Um, um, Samuel, oh, dude from Ohio. Oh, State. Curtis Samuel. Curtis. I didn't see him on there either. Okay. But you could be right. I have Brenton Burson and Russell Shepard. <laughs> Russell Shepard's gone. <laughs> wow, I must have just looked at the wrong website. So there you go. So a lot of great options there. I like the Calvin Ridley pick. I don't think it's great for fantasy. Just because there's too many weapons over there, I think it's going to help the offense open up. I think it'll help Matt Ryan a little bit. But uh, I think Calvin Ridley uh, doesn't look overwhelming, but I think he's a, he's a game-time player. Mm-hmm. Like, he's not going to do great. He did, wasn't great at the combine. He definitely underwhelmed in that respect. He doesn't have, like, all the physics. He's not a 6'3", Terrell Owens type of guy. But he just seems like he's always productive. And especially they've had some less-than-seller quarterbacks over there in, Arizona, in Alabama the last few years. They haven't really had anybody that stood out. But I just like, his, I just like him as a wide receiver. He may not be great for fantasy, but I just kind of liked – what I saw from him. Is there anything else that you guys want to talk about draft-wise? I don't know if we'll get to tight ends. I mean, tight ends are tight ends. You don't see them really kind of stand out. I mean, we saw, like, Ingram, Evan Ingram do okay. But it takes a while for tight ends really to kind of get in. Just like wide receivers we talked about, you know, it, it kind of takes them one or two seasons to finally find their, you know, find their groove a little bit in the – you know, in that sense of being comfortable in the offense, too, compared to running backs, which seems to be the easiest one. All you do is – They seem to come in right away. They just walk to the door, and they're all pro. Yeah. (laughs) Alvin Kamara. Incredible. Yeah. Just incredible. Anything you want to say before we go? I mean, do you like tight ends anything over there, Joe? Are you drafting? I agree. Second, that was like a wide receiver tight end flex spot. (laughs) All good. There's maybe like three tight ends that stand out. But what do you do with Gronk if you get rid of the tight end position? You put him as a wide receiver? Oh, you just put him in the same. I gotcha. I gotcha. Tight ends. Well, let's just get rid of kickers, too. Yeah, I like kickers. You like it? You're okay. (laughs) We'll have the kicker discussion on another station. All right, uh, another show. Kickers. What's that? They're just cheap points. They are. And I don't know how much goes into how much research. I guess opportunity. Is, is one of them, but, yeah. We'll except do kickers for, on a different show. Except for, exe- except for <laughs> I would say, Greg Zerline did get me 20 points, like, every single week last season. Yeah, season's. that was Todd's MVP. <laughs> <laughs> Good old kickers. All right, before we have about five minutes, so and I don't know how long this is even going to last. I was doing this exercise myself after I told you guys to do this, and I didn't really get through a lot. But we're going to talk about guys who, like, suffered, NFL current guys that suffered based on a guy being drafted. And so – is, does, it, does any stand out to you guys? And anybody can kind of jump out. I was thinking, like, here's, here's my best one. Uh, how about the entire AFC West offenses suffer when Bradley Chubb and Von Miller line up? Like, those, these, that's, what I, that's what I put as suffering. That was, my, that was my funniest one. But what about you guys? Anything that makes, like, difficult for anybody else to, I, that's currently? I had Odell Beckham, actually. Really? With, the, with Barkley coming in? With Barkley coming in. Okay. Um, you can take a look at Eli Manning throughout his career, but more especially, like, his past five years. He's right up there as far as passing attempts go. Mm. He's right around 600 passing attempts, which puts him, you know, top five in the league every year. And I think if you're going to bring in a three-down running back like Barkley and you're going to plan on giving him the ball, 
I mean, that's just going to cut down. I think you want to cut down on Eli's attempts anyway because he's getting old and he's terrible. <laughs> but I think that's going to hurt Odell in a way. Hasn't Odell hurt Odell? He yeah. has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if anybody hurt Odell, it's probably himself with all that nonsense. Todd, do you have anybody that suffers based on someone being drafted? I'd say, I'd say that uh, Nick Chubb and Carlos Hyde. Um, I think obviously drafting Nick Chubb at the, you know, the top of the second round and, you know, brought in Carlos Hyde. I think that's kind of a a signal that like, well, we hope Nick Chubb can be, you know, be this great running back that, you know, he's projected to be And Carlos Hyde. Like I said, he's he's getting a little bit older and he's been hurt. Um, he hasn't, like I said, he hasn't been productive, you know, in the last, you know, two, three years. Um, obviously when he first came in the league, he was, he was really, really good. But um, other than that, I think, you know, that, that one kind of stood out to me. And obviously Cleveland needs as much help as they can get. So. <laughs> what about you, Joe? Anything stand out? Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily tied to the draft, but Buffalo, I kind of want to see what LeSean McCoy is going to, how he's going to fit in or how the offense, Bill's offense is going to affect his performance. Sure. You know, going from a Tyrod Taylor quarterback to Josh Allen or, you know, I, I think Josh Allen could struggle a lot his, his rookie year here and, I don't know how that's going to affect the Sean McCoy. Is that going to be? It could be good for him to, that they rely on him more, or you know, is he just going to be the target of all the uh, every defense that goes up against the Bills? Do you think Lashawn McCoy still has it in him? He's he's getting up there. He is. I think he's got to get another good year left. In him. Okay, so Joe's pretty high on him. A couple of other ones I had: Eagles selected tight end Dallas Goddard from South Dakota State, and they just signed Zach Ertz to an extension. And I was doing some research on this Goddard guy. You know who they kind of compare him to? Zach Ertz. So I thought that was interesting. I mean, it's not a bad thing to have two of them, but you hope that as an Ertz fan, who I mean, one of the few good tight ends, that, that his production doesn't go down. The other one I thought was interesting was, does it count that Baltimore drafted two tight ends? So those two tight ends not only suffer for playing on Baltimore, but they also suffer having to play with one another. I mean, if you want to go more tight end sets, fine. But, I mean, it's already Sucksville in terms of Baltimore they, Ravenville. They, they have anyway. been trying to get that right, though, man. Oh, yeah. for sure. And that's going to go, too. That Max Williams guy was a bust. Yeah. Oh, they, man. They're, they're just trying to get that tight end situation. So they're going over yeah. like quality as opposed to quantity. Yeah. <laughs> or quantity over quality is actually what I'm trying to say. So if one of them sticks or one of them just is a blocker, and then you can use the other one as a receiving tight end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a couple minutes left to go, and we'll let Joe get out of here. He's in Grand Junction doing great things. And we appreciate him uh, coming on the show. How excited are you guys to see Hard Knocks? Now, I, I love the show. I, I watch all five episodes. Are we excited that it's Cleveland? I mean, is there things that we're going to get excited about? Joe, what do you like about this Cleveland Browns uh, Hard Knocks, if at all? You know, I'll be honest, I don't really watch Hard Knocks. <laughs> what else is on? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's an intriguing team to look at this year, especially, you know, with Baker Mayfield, how much him, his big personality, seeing uh, what he's going to bring to the team. I think, though, I don't know, I'm guessing they made the selection before the draft, but I'm <laughs> sure each go is very happy with the selection. Yeah, what about you, Mikey? You- I'm, I'm excited to see Hugh Jackson and to figure out exactly why he's so terrible <laughs> and why he can't motivate his players to win a game. Yeah, that is, that's definitely true. We'll get to see more of the inside look right. at Hugh Jackson. All eyes on Denzel Ward. That's what I'm kind of because that's what because Cleveland because Cleveland. So the cornerback, their first, their second first round. Their second, right? yeah. Uh, that's who they picked over Bradley Chubb because I would just say just as as a, a football fan, I'd be like, why wouldn't you want to have Bradley Chubb and Miles Garrett? You know, but Cleveland can just watch you know Von Miller and Bradley Chubb, and that'll be fantastic. So I'll be watching Denzel Ward because he because when you're drafting a cornerback that high, I say is he either has to be Deion Sanders or Darrell Rivas, because yeah. if you're drafting, and it that, sounds like he's shorter than both of those guys. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> if you're if draft, if, since they draft him that high, he bet he better be somewhat close to that. Because because the cre- comparison I compared Denzel Ward to, and we talked about it on the last the last podcast, was he kind of reminded me a little bit of Chris Harris, kind of that short, that uh, short running, that uh, short cornerback. And hey, we uh, Chris Harris was an undrafted free agent. He's one of the best corners in in football right now. So. That's what I'm going to be looking for because if he is any short of that, ugh, Cleveland, come on. You, they got to they gotta get, like, you, come on, be smarter. Like, he has to be somewhat close to that. He has to be somewhat close to Deion Sanders or Darrell Rivas because if, because if you're expecting a corner to help affect your team in games, especially on defense, because 
because obviously he's going to be in that division with some of the you know top wide receivers in the whole league. He he, he better he better grow some cojones pretty quick. So he's gonna. I'm I'm excited to see Josh Gordon. I hope they have a camera on him 24/7 because when he slips up, as he always does, I hope we get it on video. That's what I want to see on top of all of this. Well, that's going to do it for this podcast. Joe, thanks for coming on. Congrats on the championship. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course. We appreciate it. Uh, now that we got the kind of get his call-in feature, hopefully worked really well. We'll have you uh, call in again as we'll do more. We've done a couple more already than we've done last season, so we're super excited about that. Uh, Mikey, Todd, I wish you nothing but the worst at poker tonight. I'm hoping to come away with some cash because i got to – somehow pay for all this equipment that I had to buy to get all this, <laughs> this broadcast up and rolling. But uh, it should be fun. And, of course, you guys tune in to the next time we have our MHA podcast. We'll see you next time. MHA podcast. MHA podcast. MHA podcast.